The second lecture in this module is about planet formation. So we're going to talk about how stars form, because planets form as a byproduct of star formation. We'll talk about what we know about planet formation, either in our own solar system or by extrapolation in the new solar systems we're finding far beyond the Earth and the Sun. And we'll talk about the physical processes of accretion and differentiation that occur when planets form and then evolve. How do stars and planets form? Stars are born in dense gaseous regions of a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way in places called molecular clouds. They're called molecular clouds because they're cold enough that atoms stick together to form molecules. So that much of their material is in molecular form. That is molecular hydrogen, carbon dioxide, methane, and other molecules. The temperatures are very cold. 10 to 50 Kelvin, perhaps 100 to 200 Kelvin when they're near a young star. And there's also a large amount of dust in this region. Dust in astronomy represents small microscopic particles, less than a micron in size, that form from crystals and mineral grains on the outskirts of cool stars. Most of these gases and dusts are hydrogen and helium. The heavy elements beyond hydrogen and helium form a small fraction of the mass of a molecular cloud. A molecular cloud is a denser than average region of the galaxy where gravity has a possibility to form stars by gravitational collapse. We see molecular clouds throughout the galaxy. You can see one with the naked eye in the winter sky in the northern hemisphere. The Orion molecular cloud sits just below the belt of Orion in the Orion constellation. That's a relatively nearby molecular cloud where stars are forming even as we speak. And in many cases, stars will form throughout the galaxy continuously. So this is a process that's been going on for billions of years since we think the Milky Way is about 11 billion years old. In many cases, we think perhaps in every case, star formation is accompanied by planet formation. What happens when a molecular cloud collapses? And how does a star actually form? It took a long time to learn about this process because these regions where stars form are filled with dust, and dust obscures and reddens light. Interstellar dust was not known or discovered until the 1930s, when it became clear that visual light actually cannot escape from the center of star-forming region because of the dust. Equally, we cannot see into the center of our own galaxy because of all the dust in the plane of the Milky Way. So it took radio techniques, which only evolved in the 1940s and 1950s, before we could see directly into molecular clouds and watch star formation actually occurring. But we think the initial event is a compression caused potentially by the death of a nearby star as a supernova that triggers the collapse of a cloud that was in slight amount of rotation and slightly denser than the average regions. Triggered by some event, like a nearby dying star, the molecular cloud starts to collapse. As it collapses, it gets denser, the gravity gets stronger, and so this process accelerates. And this process is called gravitational collapse. So basically, on a very short time scale, tens of thousands of years, a large cloud can collapse to a much denser region where there's sufficient density for a star to form and for nuclear fusion to begin. We know that the large cloud from which stars collapse has a small amount of rotation. And when it collapses, conservation of angular momentum says that the central object that forms, the stars, will be rotating more rapidly. We see this with the sun. The sun, for example, rotates more rapidly than once a day, so it's spinning quite fast. The outer material in this collapsing nebula forms the peripheral cloud out of which planets will eventually form. So dust and gas that does not go into the star is distributed in a disk. And that's because in the conservation of angular momentum process, the collapse can occur more efficiently along the poles rather than along the equator, where conservation of angular momentum so that the material will be rotating quite rapidly in a plane. This is now the protoplanetary disk and there's the potential for planets to form out of the debris that's been left over from star formation. The process by which smaller rocky particles stick together to eventually become large objects 
and even planets, is called accretion. We think accretion is a general physical process that applies in all star formation regions and leads to the formation of planets essentially every place that a star forms, using the material that's left over from the collapse. In the process of accretion, the initial phase takes the particles up from dust grain sized, so microscopic, uh, to the size of perhaps dust bunnies or rocks or pebbles. And at that point, gravity can slowly take over. In their nearly circular orbits in the protoplanetary disk, the material sticks together by the force of gravity, by accretion, and as the size of the objects grows, their gravity grows, and so more objects are pulled in. This process sounds inefficient and slow, but it actually occurs relatively quickly. Simulations suggest that the planets in the solar system, in our solar system, form in only a few tens of millions of years. And this is a system that is four and a half billion years old. So a tiny fraction at the beginning of the history of the solar system was sufficient to form all the planets from rocky material. Now some of these accretion events are violent. And so in the initial phases, there's almost as much destruction as creation going on. There are cataclysms where large objects come together at a sufficient speed that they break apart. But for the most part, it's construction. And so gradually objects grow in size until they've used up all the material in the protoplanetary disk. Radiation from the hot young star then drives away the remaining gas and empties out that space, leaving a set of co-orbiting planets surrounding a young star. In this situation, where we have a young star, and for example, the sun was much more luminous than it is now when it was in its first few million years of age. This is called the T Tauri phase of a young star. You have a hot, young, luminous star surrounded by planets where there's some residual material gradually being driven away by radiation from the star. The key physics that goes on now is called the condensation curve. The condensation curve, which you can see here, gives the temperature as a function of distance from the star, in this case the sun, and you can see the planets of the solar system. And different minerals or materials can condense either liquefy from a gas or solidify from a liquid or go straight from vapor to solid uh, at particular temperatures. So there is a distance within which all gaseous materials are vaporized and driven away and no liquids like water can exist. Only solid rocks and perhaps even metals can exist in solid form. Then there's a distance at which liquid water is possible. And then there's a distance at which icy materials can form and persist. The main demarcation in these young solar systems is called the frost line. Inside the frost line, it's too hot for hydrogen compounds to form ice. Outside the frost line, it's cold enough for ices to form. So in this simplistic view of a young solar system, inside the frost line is where we'd expect to find primarily rocky materials or rocks mixed with metals. And outside the frost line is where we expect the rocky materials to be mixed with ices or even water. Here we see an animation of a protoplanetary disk. It's important to remember this is not real data. This is simulated data or an animation. Planets form by condensing and accreting in zones within the circulating planetary disk. And eventually the rest of the material is driven out by the young star's radiation. The other main distinction with distance from the form, newly formed star is the type of planet that will form. In our solar system, we see a binary distinction between small, rocky, terrestrial planets, those inside the asteroid belt, and that's Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and large gas giants further out, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. That binary distinction we believe is followed in other solar systems as well. What happens is the small rocky planets form closer in where there's less material to form a massive planet. And their gravity is never sufficient to attract large gaseous atmospheres. Whereby further from the sun or another star like the sun, the rocky cores are also there, but there's more gaseous material for them to attract. And over time they grow gaseous mantles, which eventually dominate their mass. And so we have Mars, Mercury, Venus, and the Earth, which are primarily rocky, 
with slender gaseous envelopes that are a tiny fraction of their mass, and then the four gas giants of the outer solar system that do have rocky cores, probably somewhat larger than the Earth, but the bulk of their mass is in the form of hydrogen and helium, the same material that the Sun is mostly made of. Astronomers have recently developed a technology to actually watch this process in operation. We've seen beautiful pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope of the nebulae and the star formation regions where stars are forming, but as I mentioned, visual light cannot penetrate these regions, so we need radio techniques to see deep inside a molecular cloud. Well, with telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope, we have the angular resolution, the sharpness of imaging, that allow us to see star formation occurring and, in particular, to blank out the light of the star and see the surrounding area and what's happening to that material. In this image, we can see real data from the Hubble Space Telescope of the star TW Hydrae. And on the left-hand side, the central region is dark because the very bright star at the center of this region has been occulted or taken out of the view, allowing us to amplify the light from the region around where planets, we believe, are forming. So we're actually starting to see this process of planets forming from a disk of material, sweeping up material, creating gaps, and eventually leading to a set of fully fledged planets. So this is a snapshot in a process that takes maybe a few tens of millions of years, where by judiciously picking targets, we can watch it occurring at different stages in the evolution and the creation of planets. What are the physical processes that happen once you have a planet? a rocky planet. One of the key processes is called differentiation. When planets form, the star is young and hot, and the molten material out of which they form takes a while to solidify and radiate extra heat into space. So the planets initially are truly molten, or for a while stay viscous where the material can actually move, much like magma inside the Earth. In this semi-fluid state, denser material sinks to the center. The analogy of this would be to have a bowl where you have popcorn and marbles. And if you mix them well, but then shake the bowl, the marbles will settle to the bottom, the popcorn will float to the top, and they'll segregate those materials. The same thing happens with rocks and metals inside the Earth. The heaviest material goes to the center, and so in rocky planets like the Earth and others, we have cores made of iron and nickel, almost purely, and then the outer regions, the mantle and then the crust, are much lighter or less dense rocky materials that have essentially floated to the top. And the crust, because the interior of the Earth is liquid, the crust of the Earth is literally floating on that rocky material in a molten state. So differentiation creates a very similar internal structure to planets like the Earth. And we believe this process would apply in other solar systems as well. Differentiation in the gas giant planets happens slightly differently. We believe the gas giants all have rocky cores. Their masses are measured indirectly by satellite missions that NASA has launched over the decades. But we think that Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune each have a rocky core that's about three to five, perhaps 10 times the mass of the Earth. And within those rocky cores, differentiation will occur as it does on the Earth and Venus. But meanwhile, the planet is dominated by its gaseous envelope. And within that gaseous envelope, the various elements also segregate according to differentiation, with the lighter elements to the outside and the heavier elements concentrating to the interior. The other thing that happens is the pressure on the inside of this gaseous atmosphere is intense, and it leads to a strange state where the interior of the gaseous envelope can actually form a liquid, even a metal state, although it's almost pure hydrogen. Metallic hydrogen is essentially unknown in a terrestrial situation. These situations only occur with gas giant planets. Meanwhile, what we see in a telescope or with the naked eye is the much cooler outer layer of gas clouds. So let's take an overview of the process of planet formation. We have the collapse of a molecular cloud within which actually hundreds or perhaps even thousands of stars will form and their attendant planets. Within each of these miniature collapsing regions, subfragmenting from a much larger cloud, a central star forms and then a disk around it from which planets will form. That's the protoplanetary disk. Then the process of accretion builds planets in stages, starting from tiny 
rock and ice particles to things called planetesimals, which are about the size of a city, 10 kilometers, and then upward to protoplanets, which are maybe 100 to 1,000 kilometers in diameter. And these objects are large enough and have strong enough gravity to pull other objects similar size towards them. So the last stage of planet construction occurs quite quickly. Within each of the fully fledged and newly formed planets, differentiation causes the heavier materials to sink to the center. The planet continues to grow by attracting nearby matter. In the case of an inner planet or terrestrial planet, it can only accrete a small atmosphere. But in the outer parts of a solar system, over time, large gaseous atmospheres can be attracted. How many times has this process of star and then planet formation occurred in our galaxy, the Milky Way? There are somewhere between 100 and 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. That number sounds uncertain, as if astronomers are unsure. It's because most of the stars in our galaxy are actually low-mass red dwarfs that are very hard to count and even observe beyond the local neighborhood of the sun. But stars like the sun may be 10% of that large number. Some stars have very short lives and will probably annihilate any planets when the star goes supernova. That would be the case of the first found pulsar planet from 1992. But there are many more long-lived stars than short-lived stars. When we say the sun is a typical star, that's not strictly correct, because it's not an average or median star. It's a middleweight star, but most of the stars in the Milky Way are half, a third, or a fifth the mass of the sun, and live much stronger, much longer lives, and have much less radiation than the sun. We don't know yet what the demographics of planets around all the various stars in the Milky Way are. But recent results from the Kepler spacecraft suggest that one-fifth to one-half of all stars have at least one planet. So the math is pretty simple. We're faced with the prospect of literally billions, perhaps a hundred billion planets of all kinds, just in our one galaxy. If we take the conservative estimate of one-fifth of all stars in the Milky Way having one planet and assume the conservative number, excluding the low-mass stars, of 100 billion stars in the Milky Way, the product is 20 billion stars with planets in the Milky Way galaxy. How many planets? We don't know. We would have to measure how many planets per star system, a number that we're still unsure about. As data continues to come in, the percentage of stars with exoplanets continue to climb. And some studies have suggested that essentially every star has a planet. So that number of 20 billion is likely to be a lower limit. To summarize this lecture, we've seen that the process of star formation naturally leads to planet formation. And since this happened in the solar system, we anticipate it's a universal process playing out in the Milky Way and other galaxies. After the central star forms, planets accrete fairly quickly, converting from tiny dust-sized particles to planetesimals that are the size of a small moon up to fully-fledged planets in perhaps 10 or 20 million years. We can see this process occurring with careful observations using telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope. This process of accretion is fundamental to planet formation everywhere in the universe. Meanwhile, within a planet, differentiation segregates the material to the denser material to the center, less dense material to the outer parts. This is happening also in planets more efficiently when they've just formed and are still molten. We can use data from the Kepler telescope in particular to estimate the number of planets in the Milky Way galaxy. And the best guess at the moment is essentially every star in the Milky Way has at least one planet.